Hey, in this lesson, we'll see how VP9 quality compares to H.264, HEBC, and AV1 in a video on demand setting. We'll do a brief overview, then we'll look at the command strings I used in FFmpeg to produce all the files. We'll look at encoding time, and then we'll look at the quality comparisons uh, with a pretty unique methodology, I think, of comparing different codecs. And also, we'll look at the comparison, see how VP9 uh, fared compared to the codecs above. And then we'll reach a quick conclusion. I just wanted to start by pointing out that, you know, standards are standards and codecs are codecs. So, you know, we are looking at implementations of VP9, AV1, H.264, and ATBC, not the standards themselves. So we are looking at codecs within FFmpeg. And in the case of X.264, it's generally considered to be best of breed with X.265. And this is a Moscow State University report. You see X.265 here, and you see several other X.265 encoders that are more efficient. AV1 is reasonably competitive, um, but you see a, a more effective AV1 here. And then VP9 is here, and Moscow State didn't test any other VP9 implementations, um, though there are some that are commercially available that may be better quality than the FFmpeg version. And the one I'm tried to include in this analysis, as I've tried many times, is from two Orioles. So check them out. I think that's the VP9 implementation that Netflix uses, and I think it's more efficient than uh, libvpx vp9, which is the official codec that we looked at. So we're not comparing VP9, H.264, ATBC, and AV1. We're comparing libvpx vp9 with x.265, x.264, and libaom-av1. Again, the codec implementations in FFmpeg. And then here's the command strings. Don't want to spend a lot of time here. I derived these in an article that you can read at this bit.ly URL. And then encoding times, you know, I started encoding the files, and my preconception was that VP9 was going to be pretty slow. And what I learned is that VP9 is actually pretty fast, uh, especially as compared to X.265, which I tested in the, uh, the very slow preset as I did X.264. It was so slow that I tested on three different machines. These are two single core machines, and this is a dual core machine, and X.264, X.265, VP9, AV1, and we see the averages for the two files that I tested on each machine. The average time X.264 was around a minute, X.265 very slow preset, was 11.25. VP9 was only about twice X.264, again using the very slow preset, and AV1 was the laggard, as we expected, at around 16 minutes, uh, about 50% slower than X.265. So again, it looked high, uh, and this is the version of FFmpeg that I tested. It looked so high that I went back and I, I checked previous iterations or previous tests that I had done to, to make sure that I didn't make a mistake and to, to see if the results were consistent. And I tested back in 2018, and X.264 very slow was 18 seconds in this test. X.265 very slow was 289 for a multiple of around 16.05. So very much slower than X.264 here. Um, same test on September 18th, 2020, and we had a 12.87 multiple, and these tests were an 11.8 times multiple. So again, it's, we're not comparing VP9 this particular slide against X.265, we're comparing X.265 against X.264, both using the very slow preset, and the encoding times are relatively consistent. So I think you see a lot of comparisons where VP9 is very, very slow. I think in most cases, that's because they're using the slowest preset, which delivers very little additional quality in a very extended encoding time. I started this analysis using the medium preset for X.264 and X.265, and performance was significantly behind VP9 in the case of X.265. So my, my assumption was most producers who were using X.265 would probably use the very slow preset because they want to get the best possible quality. VP9, the different presets didn't make too big a difference. With X.265, they made a really, really big difference. And that's why I used uh, very slow for X.265 and for X.264. Okay, so the goal in testing codecs is to test them as they would be used in real world use. And that means you've got to create a different encoding ladder for each test file, which I did. And it also means that you've got to create a different encoding ladder for each codec because different codecs are going to compress um, different uh, resolutions at different quality levels. So let me tell you what I did. Um, I used a procedure that's pretty well documented. It's the Netflix convex hull analysis. And what Netflix does um, 
when they're producing their, their per title encoding is they encode every clip at multiple resolutions. So you see here 1080p, 720p, 540p, 360p, and then they encode at multiple bit rates. And that's these over here on the left. And up here, it's all 1080p, there's no surprise. But when you're in the 1200 range, what you do there is you use VMAF to, VMAF is a, a video quality metric, to identify the, the highest quality resolution at this data rate. So with all encoding ladders for all test clips for all codecs, I started with the data rate where you first uh, achieved a 95 VMAF rating. And 95 is a pretty good rating that most companies would want to target for the top rung of their encoding ladder. There's a white paper out there that says anything beyond 93 is not going to be noticed by viewers. So if you target 95, you know, you've got pretty good quality. If you target 98, uh, the difference between 95 and 93, nobody's going to notice, but you're probably wasting a lot of bandwidth. So I started each encoding ladder for each uh, clip for each codec at 95, and then I multiplied the data rate, in this case 5.6, by 0.6. And I multiplied by 0.6 because that achieves the 1.5 to 2x differential between rungs that Apple specified so that you don't you don't have too big a jump to leave some people stranded at the lower rate and you don't have rungs that are so close together that uh, they essentially don't deliver any different perceivable quality. So I said, okay, you know, where do we get where do we hit 95? 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. I knew what the data rates were. And then I used this convex hall analysis to figure out which resolution was going to deliver the highest quality at that bit rate. So in this case, 5600 was 1080p, 34 again 1080p, 2 megabits, 720, 1200, 720, 700 dropped down to 540, stayed there for 400, and then into 360p at the 200 kilobit per second. And basically, once the encoding ladder got beyond or below 300 kilobits per second, I stopped. So, and then, you know, I repeated for each codec for each clip to get the optimal ladder for each clip for each codec. So each, you know, each test run for each encoding clip, which were 10 seconds long, was around 800 different encodes and a lot of analysis. And this is what it looked like for a particular test clip. So this is x.264 and this is x.265. And typically this is the pattern that you'll see where with the higher quality codecs, you push 1080p down further in the encoding ladder because it can preserve quality with the large block sizes and other tools. And you see less and less usage of the lower resolution rungs. Not so much with x.265, but with EP9, you got the highest quality video using this analysis at 1080p all the way down to 200 kilobits per second. And AV1, same thing. AV1 wasn't able to hit the data rates here. Uh, VP9 was. And we see the encoding ladder looks very different than what we see with X.264s. And this is what I found. So these are the rate distortion curves and these are the BD rate stats. And you know, it, it's we see that all of the rate distortion curves start at right around 95 because the methodology that they used started the encoding ladder at 95, no surprise there. And then we see in, in pretty much all cases, uh, H.264 is here. You know, it's the highest data rate to achieve the 95 target. And then the purple AV1 was the lowest data rate to achieve the 95 total and, you know, came down at 200 kilobits per second and still delivered very, very good quality. And then we see some trade-off here between VP9 in green and X.265 in red. But in, in almost all cases, and this will become very important in a few minutes, X.265 was able to deliver the 95 target at a substantial reduction in data rate as compared to not only uh, H.264, but also VP9. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. So I'm going to kind of scroll through the through these. And here, VP9 was even less efficient at the top end than, um, than H.264, and here's HEVC, and here's AV1. And obviously, you can stop the video anytime and, and study any of these that you would like. And I, I, you know, I just wanted to point out here, we're seeing in this particular clip, this is the uh, red carpet sequence at the beginning of the first Zoolander movie. And what we're seeing here is that overall, using these BD rate stats, VP9 was able to deliver, on average, the same quality as X.265 at around a 4.69% reduction in bitrate. But what you see is here at the top end, 
X.265 was more efficient than VP9. And this is where all the bandwidth savings are, right? I mean, VP9 was very efficient here between 200 and 450 uh, kilobits per second. And on average, that's why it bested X.265 in this particular comparison. But if you're delivering all your streams up here, then the BD rate stats become meaningless. And we're going to look at the summary numbers. So these are the summary numbers. So libvpx vp9 was it able to deliver the same quality as x.264 at a reduction in bit rate of around 21.06%. So those are the BD rate stats. And you may think, well, gosh, 21%, that's worth chasing. But we'll look at really what that means in a moment. And, you know, as compared to x.265, vp9 was less efficient by around 11.83%. And, you know, libaom-ab1 was the star of the show, allowing a 49% reduction in uh, bit rate at the same quality as x.264, 34% for x.265, and around 36.92% for VP9. Now, again, these are overall BD rate numbers, and I want to make the point that you know, we like BD rate because it measures codec performance, but you can't use BD rate as an estimate of the bandwidth savings that that codec is going to deliver. And, you know, what we see here is that over this entire test area, libvpx should be able to deliver on average about the same quality at around 21% lower bit rate than x.264 here. But, on, you know, that only applies, you only get that bit rate saving with this rung here. So between this rung and this rung, that's where the 21% is. But if you're serving this x.264 rung, and then you switch to VP9, you're going to be serving this VP9 rung. So the difference in bit rate is only from 1500 to say 1300. So you get the maximum savings up here and very much smaller and smaller savings down in the encoding ladder. So how do you figure out what your actual savings are going to be? That's what I did here. There's a lot of data and let me, um, let me tell you what we have. So this is the x.264 encoding ladder on average for the nine files that I tested. So, you know, using the technique that I talked about before, starting at, you know, 95.6.6.6 and then figuring out what the data rates are and the resolutions and the resultant VMAF scores, all these are the same in terms of the raw scores in this column. And then what I did is I used three different assumptions regarding the distribution of that encoding ladder, which streams would actually be viewed by viewers watching from a remote location. And so in this case, I assume that 50% of viewers would watch the top stream and so on and so on to get to 100% here. And then I figured out what the actual bit rate distributed under this assumption would be and what the VMAF quality would be under this assumption. So that's this distribution pattern. That's this distribution pattern, 100% of the top stream and then this is a more mobile-centric distribution pattern that's heavy in the middle. And then down here, this is the VP9 encoding ladder. And then I interpolated these percentages here to these percentages here and then did the math again. You know, what's the average bit rate that I'm serving and what's the VMAF quality? And again, I did that three times for this distribution pattern, for this distribution pattern, and for this distribution pattern. And what we saw was that at this distribution pattern, which is pretty realistic, this is what you would expect um, in the US, maybe in Europe, we didn't see a 20% bandwidth savings. We saw an about 11.36% bandwidth savings. And then we saw that the, um, the VMAF delta was only around one point. So we got a one point increase in VMAF uh, as a result of converting over to VP9 with this encoding ladder and, and these distribution assumptions. Now, this is the best case in terms of um, maximum savings for bitrate. So if you deliver 100% of streams in the top rung, you're going to save 15% bandwidth. Now, why is it lower than the 21% suggested here? Because that's the difference between x.264 here and vp9 here. None of this stuff matters if you're delivering 100% of streams here. And then if you've got a mobile-centric encoding ladder, what we see is that you get a 6.51% reduction in bit rate, you know, the bandwidth savings, and you get a 1.86 increase in VMAF score, you know, by converting over from X.264 or from X.264 to, to VP9 with this distribution ladder. So 
overall, these results um, just aren't that impressive, right? I mean, they're, you're seeing on a, on a probable U.S. and uh, European ladder, you're seeing an, an 11.36 effective savings, which is probably not going to move anybody's needle unless you're distributing a whole lot of streams. And then I did the same analysis for HEVC and AV1. You see the three distribution patterns here. This is the HEVC ladder. And once again, we interpolated the streams, the different data rates. And we see with this distribution pattern, we've got a 20.79% savings, which is, which is substantial, with a 0.98 VMAF uplift. Here, the best case, where we're retrieving the top stream, we see the difference between this and this, which is around 26.63, and then VMAF is going to be about the same because we started all ladders at around 95. And then here with this mobile specific pattern, we, save, we see a savings of around 19.34% with a minimal uplift in, v, in uh, VMAF quality. And then here's AV1. What we see, same distribution patterns. We're seeing a 31% improvement here, which is quite substantial, along with a 4.39 VMAF uplift, which is going to be you know, noticeable. Here with the best case, we're seeing a 45.41% bandwidth savings, and that certainly is worth chasing if you're distributing most of your streams at the top end of your encoding ladder. Again, no change in the VMAF score because every ladder started at 95. And in the mobile distribution, we see a 16.31 reduction in bandwidth along with a 6.84 increase in VMAF score, which almost certainly will be noticeable and will be worth chasing to improve the quality of people who are watching on lower bandwidth streams and reduce churn. So where does that leave us? You know, in general, if you're going to use the VP9 version and FFmpeg, you're, you're not going to see a significant uh, savings in bandwidth unless you're distributing on a massive scale. And if you're distributing on a massive scale, you probably should chase even more savings by using a, a third-party VP9 encoder if you can find one that delivers better quality. The encoding time is very competitive. The decode time is, you know, we didn't look at it here, but it's very competitive. But, you know, AV1 plays in most of the same places that VP9 does, at least on the browser. So I would be looking more towards AV1 than I would be considering VP9 at this point. Anyway, that's the lesson on how VP9, or at least uh, libvpx-vp9, compares to the AV1, H.264, and HEVC codecs that are in FFmpeg.